and just takes over everything. They take over fucking Cincinnati, Louisville, St. Louis, Columbus, Chicago, Cincinnati, New Orleans. Um, Slow River Trade Economy Sparks Riot, 1863. So, courthouse riot, this is Cincinnati. Civil unrest woven into the fucking fabric. So, the 1840s and 1850s, Cincinnati society became increasingly unstable as German and Irish immigrants poured into the Queen City. By 1851, Cincinnati was the nation's fifth largest city. So, it's a fast growing town. There's about 50,000 was in Louisville, right? Now, there's about, what, a million? Maybe 500, half a million or so in Louisville proper. Um, in 1853, German Catholics took to the streets on Christmas armed with guns, pistols, clubs, canes, slingshots, trying to run Cardinal Bedini out of town. The Germans, many of who fled the United States after the failed European revolutions of 1848, saw the priest as a symbol of repression, Mr. Hurley says. We need to learn that the revolutions of 1848, the intellectual fucking Karl Marx and Hegel, they couldn't connect with the working classes. They couldn't make that connection. Yeah, revolution is good for you and democracy and voting, blah, blah, blah. But the prince was offering paid positions in his army. So I could get a job and fucking eat or I could go along with you and starve and maybe probably lose and get shot because you're going to send me, uh, use me as cannon fodder too, just like uh, fucking bastards are. So instead of being an ivory tower of intellectuals, let's fucking get working class people together. It's economics. Fix the fucking economics. And it won't fix the racism and sexism, but it'll lead it in the right direction. Throwing money at a problem doesn't fix it, but it, it can help, right? Throwing money at a problem can help it. Of course it can. Ultimately, it takes the right solution. That's what you need, the right solution, and so that's what you need. Um, Catholics, German Catholics took to the street on Christmas. Right, they were protesting it. Two years later, in 1855, Cincinnati's establishment, nativists so-called fucking nativist. Not so-called. They were the nativist. Not native. The native original Americans were the fucking Shawnee, but these white cracker-ass motherfuckers are sitting there saying, you know, we were here first. Fuck you Germans. Fuck you Irish. Fuck anybody who ain't Anglo-Saxon uh, English. Now, you better speak English. You better speak our fucking language. Don't speak your stupid fucking tongue. Speak our tongue. Germans might prevent... Residents from voting for J.D. Taylor, the mayor or candidate for the anti-immigrant American party, also known as the Know Nothing Party. So the German Americans barricaded streets and over the Rhine, north edge of the Miami Erie Canal, which is now Central Parkway, which is why it's called Over the Rhine, because of the Miami Erie Canal. So you have the fucking canal going through the street, and the Germans lived right up across from the canal. Members of the Turners, a German physical fitness organization, brilliant idea, exercise in body and mind, Right, or body and mind. Members of the Turners, German physical fitness organization, aimed their cannon and shot it over the head of the mob of the fucking nativists, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants that came at them, says Don Heinrich Tolzman, University of Cincinnati German-American Studies Director and curator of UC's German-American Collection. In the middle of the 19th century, tensions ran high between the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and Germans. Mr. Tolzman says Cincinnati's German population had become such a force at the ballot box that they pushed for and received bilingual education in the city schools. They're going to teach German in the city schools and then Sunday beer sales. Um, so they got the fucking alcohol passed. So, there was, you know, no prohibition. And they got German spoken in the fucking schools. World War One's going to happen and Cincinnati's going to ban all the fucking Germans in everywhere. No German books, no German languages, no bilingual education, no fucking German streets. And just wiped out all the fucking German culture. You had newspapers in Cincinnati, you had newspapers in Louisville, uh, many newspapers, fucking like 20 or so, and like about a five or maybe more of German newspapers, plus you had the nativists had their fucking newspapers, and then you had other like anti-nativists, so like you had lots of fucking newspapers, just a, a hotbed of political, it's almost like Jerusalem with the fucking uh, Jesus Christ, it's just a hotbed of sort of political activism and um, dissent and um, we need to change and do some, you know, do something different. So the uh, the in Cincinnati, the Germans had one bilingual education in the city schools and Sunday beer sales. So you know the fucking Germans, right? The Catholics, they have alcohol, they're drinkers and shit. But actually, the beer brewery industry has been with the German. And actually, Kentucky, Kentucky, you don't understand. You don't see the fucking connection between brewery beer and Kentucky. I mean, like we um. 
we when we were uh, 1774 when they started colonizing Kentucky. You know, we got bourbon, we got whiskey, so we were known for something to for distilling this shit. In fact, when they didn't have money, they would use whiskey as currency. So they didn't have money, they would at least use a product that they had created in order to, you know, uh, buy their goods and to sort of make the economy work. But that's what the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants were against. They were fucking such Puritans. In fact, uh, Muldraw is fucking dry today. Um, it's the county is wet, but Muldraw for some reason is fucking dry. I don't know. It makes no real fucking sense to be honest with you. Um, so there's you know it's sort of you know but there's prohibition all over the place and it didn't really work. So but whatever. It's um. Uh, the fucking Germans, right? They fucking stood up and they, um, the Germans would parade the streets holding their huge steins and have hit picnics. Steins, I guess that's like a beer mug or something, and then have picnics, so they believed in a continental Sunday. So they were just fucking different. That's all it really was. They were slightly fucking different. Um, the nativists would be incensed by it. They stormed and harassed Germans at church festivals and picnics. Irish immigrants rioted against African Americans in 1861 and 1862 in river traffic disrupted by the Civil War. There was lots of friction between Irish and blacks who lived together in the poor neighborhood. East of downtown competed for the same unskilled riverfront drop jobs. Often in the summer there was trouble back in the day before the docks, uh, dams and locks. The river dried up and then river workers were idle. So I don't think the Irish are particularly racist. The Irish just saw themselves in direct competition with blacks for jobs. It was an economic thing. Twenty years after the Civil War, Cincinnati experienced its worst unrest when the courthouse was burned to, okay, 1880. This is all just fucking Cincinnati. Um, the municipal election held uh, April 2nd, 1855, was bitterly contested, resulted in a riot and over the Rhine between the Germans and the Know-Nothings. In this contest, J.J. Farron, right, the mayor of the Margaret Garner case, the black woman, the slave woman who murdered, who slit her daughter's throat, um, when she was trying to get away from the Boone County Massa, the fucking Baptist, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Massa, right? So again, these wasp people, they believe in owning slaves, they believe in murdering Native American people, they believe in taking Mexican land, so they believe in manifest destiny and using blood and violence in order to achieve their goals, even if it means using bo blood and violence against fucking Germans and Irish. In this contest, J.J. Farron was a candidate of the Democratic Party for mayor. He was opposed by J.D. Taylor, representing the American or uh, Know Nothing Party. During the day, the story got out about in the German words over the canal. Those designing to vote for the so-called Know Nothing were not to be permitted to exercise a franchise in some of the voting places were possible some irregularities. The story is much exaggerated. Finally, a number of young men gathered in the lower part of the city and marched towards the Vine Street Bridge. The contest arose over a cannon which had been placed by the Germans in such a position as to sweep the bridge. Fortunately, the intervention of more peaceful citizens stopped the violence for a time. In the evening, a meeting was held at the Fifth Street Marketplace as a result of which a squad of half-grown men and boys with um, fife, Let's see, drums, uh, and flag marched up Vine Street. Rifles? Fife? I don't know. But uh, a squad of, you know, boys, men, and shit are going over there to fucking harass the Germans over the bridge. Here the Germans are gathered in a considerable force and fired upon the attacking crowd from the windows of their houses, wounding several. The, the know-nothings were swept back for a time. The German residents thereupon prepared a um, breastwork across Vine Street near... Freeman's Hall, drays, wagons, and carts were placed in great numbers along the sidewalks and across the street interlocked with each other, and behind this invention were perhaps 5,000 people armed with stone sticks, bludgeons, revolvers, muskets, carbines, ro uh, rifles, slingshots, and all the various instruments of offensive and defensive warfare. In the crowd were the Satchfield guards and several German military companies, as well as large number of Irish citizens. Patrols were parading about the streets, preparing to give the alarm for uh, the foreign citizens remained in camp for a day. All the danger of the attack, um, or until all the danger of the attack was over. In the contest, the election day, the foreman of one of the breweries was killed by a know nothing. So they did murder people in Germany. This, according to some accounts, precipitated the fight. Mr. Rowe, in his history of the police force, quotes the account of New York Tribune, April 7, 1855. To the effect that the Americans, the know nothings, took possession of the ballot boxes, destroyed the tickets, and that they 
uh, turned out in mass and taken a cannon from the Dutch and Irish, turned in upon them and fired, as a result of which ten to twelve persons were thought to be killed and many wounded. Another account told of a party of rowdies going to a German, a German drinking house where they demanded beer. After receiving it, they broke everything in the house, dr knocked the proprietor, senseless assaulted his wife and children. After this, they left the premises and meeting four Germans on the sidewalk, knocked down three and fatally stabbed the fourth. Naturally, the Germans armed themselves in self-defense. So, taking a cannon from the Dutch and Irish, turned it upon them and fired. So they took a cannon from the Dutch and the Irish, and the native, um, the fucking know-nothing Anglo, the Anglo-Saxons, almost the Protestant Anglo-Saxons, fucking took the cannon and used it against the Germans. So the Protestant Anglo-Saxons, the English, it's just Protestant English. I don't even know why we say Anglo-Saxons. The imperializing English, the Protestant English, right? So the Protestant English, um, see these men obtained admission to the Protestant English society and gained possession of its no nothing Protestant English signs and passwords. And when they saw the election, bade fair to go against them. They called the members of the party together with the purpose of destroying the ballot box in the strongest German ward in their city, hoping to gain the election by that means. The story of this right is clouded in much obscurity and a careful reading of the local papers of the time gives little assistance in obtaining the real facts. Party passions ran so high that any and all stories were believed and at this late date it's impossible to determine the merits of the uprising. On the evening of the day after election, a Newport citizen named Morgan was shot on Vine Street from an upper window. Over 10,000 know-nothing English Protestants wearing a small white soft hat known as the know-nothing hat took part in his funeral. In 1855, a meeting took place in Cincinnati between two men who are afterwards associated during the most critical times in the nation's history, Edwin N. Stanton and Abraham Lincoln. And then it goes on and on. This is uh, the centennial history of Cincinnati and, uh, and representative citizens. So the Know Nothing riots was, uh, was a bad time for everybody, right? Uh, especially in Cincinnati. There's... They used cannons, right? They were bringing fucking cannons out. They had muskets, revolvers, ropes, guns. You heard about that in the um, in Cincinnati. The Germans basically the fucking crowd, when they realized they was being attacked, they brought anything and any you know everything. And they brought ropes. They brought fucking you know pitchforks, whatever, anything that could be a weapon. If you didn't have a gun, you picked up some fucking thing that could have been a weapon. And they had barricaded themselves, and they were ready to fucking fight. You know, a force. They were ready for a pitched battle. They believed that they were being discriminated against to that extent. They were the Rhine people, they were the Germans in a fucking different district, and these goddamn, you know, fucking Protestant English mad bastards were such, you know, shitty bastards. They were fucking shitty to the, uh, the Irish, they were shitty to the Catholics, they were shitty to everybody and anybody, and that's, uh, they were going to try to fucking pad the election, right? Steal the fucking ballot boxes and say, hey, they didn't get no fucking, um, they didn't get any, um, votes. So, the, the reason why I'm making a million fucking videos of the 1855 is to bring it back to life, to bring it back to life, because it's important. It's how I think about my German ancestors and the bullshit that they fucking came into. What was the society like when my German ancestors fucking said, hey, we ain't got no visa, we ain't got no fucking, we're, gonna, we're here, we're queer, get used to it, right? We're here, we're German, get used to it. So, you know, when they came here, what was the, what bullshit did they have to fucking encounter? Why don't we speak the German tongue today? Why do we lo lose all of our fucking German ancestry? Two world wars, and then fucking shitty-ass Protestant English bastards were such fucking stuck-up pieces of shit. Protestant English are the reason why we've been siding with England for the long-ass fucking time until today. We were against the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution. We were fighting Canada against the British, the fucking English... Burned down the goddamn White House. They're the ones that had oppressed us to begin with. We're speaking their tongue. We're talking their fucking tongue. It's always been the goddamn, the English, the British Empire. It was smashed, okay? The Austrian Empire smashed. Russian Empire. It's all fucking smashed. You only got America, superpower now. We're the fucking empire. That was the fucking point, right? Anyways, my, um, actually, I probably should start this story out. Oh, yeah, I'll start that story out with the next one. Um,. I'm not sure how I'm going to round this out. Let's, Mark Twain, okay? So there's some story about Mark Twain. Actually, he was in St. Louis in 1854 when there was a no nothing riot that had happened. And he was actually talking shit about the fucking um, Irish. So Mark Twain was he caught up. He was hating the fucking Catholics. and was like, you know, Catholics shouldn't buy land in this country. It's our country. They can't buy land. If they buy land, then they'll fucking have a stronghold. And then the papacy will be fucking controlling us. We just got out from Europe and all the fucking bullshit. Now we have to bring it back here. And then, um, and then the foreigners. So there's, let's see, Philadelphia, there's at least one foreigner for every American. So basically one and one. 
foreign, he misspelled foreign to be an imitation of the iron accent. To have time with the most jolly, delightful Jesuit. Eventually, he fucking is nice, but he started out being a dick. He talked about a venerable Irishman with a benevolent face, a tongue that works easily in a socket. He has a good deal of character, much better company than the sappy literature he was selling. A random remark connecting Irishman and beer brought this nugget of information. Don't drink it, sir. They can't drink it, sir. Irishman, Mark Twain, coming up.